Crossfire Shot is the new hotness from TBS, and if you have Crossfire and you have OpenTX, then you seriously, seriously need to be thinking about whether you want to start using this. Even though it is not yet available as an official OpenTX release, it is only available with a nightly build from TBS, there are still some performance advantages, and today I'm going to show you how you can try it out for yourself. It's actually not as hard as if you ever flashed your radio before. It's surprisingly easy to try Crossfire Shot out and decide if it's worth it to you. But we're also going to talk about like what problem does this actually solve and what does it do like in our black box logs to make things better for us. I'm Joshua Bardwell and you're going to learn something today. Before we dive deep into this, let me give you the short version for those of you who just want to skip to the end and try it out. In order to try Crossfire Shot, you need to have OpenTX 235 installed on your radio. You're actually going to overwrite it with the nightly build that TBS is putting out, but that nightly build is based on 235. So installing OpenTX Companion version 235 and installing the 235 SD card contents will have you ready to go. Then you need to download the nightly build of OpenTX and flash that to your radio. And I will be showing you how to do all of this, but for those who kind of already know how to do it, just download that file and flash it. There's a link in the video description. And in TBS Agent X, you're going to need to have Crossfire firmware version 328 or newer. 328 is actually an official build and it supports Crossfire Shot. So that's the version that I am using. And these newer versions don't seem to have any updates related to Crossfire Shot. So I suggest that you use 328. But if you're on an earlier version than 328, it will not work. And if you do those things, then you'll be using Crossfire Shot. And if you know how to do those things and you want to just run and go do them, then you can. But for everybody else who wants more explicit instructions, this is the video for you. The first question I want to address is, what is the problem that Crossfire Shot is solving? Because we kind of heard, oh, it improves latency. But what's it really doing? There's a problem in OpenTX with the synchronization between the radio and any external module. And here's the analogy I've decided I'm going to go with. Let's imagine that there are two uh, train rails, right? Two um, subway rails. And every five minutes, one car appears. And every five minutes, one car pulls away. Now, if you're trying to transfer between those two lines, it's very simple. Your train pulls up, you get off, you go over to the other one, and you're on your way very quickly and efficiently. But what if that second train was a little bit early or a little bit late. So you show up, you get off your train, and oops, that other train has already left. Well, now you're going to be sitting there for five minutes till the next train comes. So that synchronization between those trains, that moment when you are ready to get off the one train and the other train is ready to receive you, if that is synchronized, then everything is very efficient and latency is minimized. But if those two things are not synchronized, then there's a period where you're just kind of sitting around waiting for the next train and latency increases. And that is what happens because of the lack of, they call it heartbeat sync, the lack of heartbeat sync in OpenTX between the radio and the module. The radio has a packet of data ready to send about the stick positions and the, 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 the switch positions, but the module is not ready to receive it and that increases latency. So what we're seeing here, if you're not super familiar with black boxes, this red line is RC command, and that is basically your stick input. So as the line goes up, the stick is deflecting further to the right. This um, bluish line is the set point, and when everything is working perfectly, the gyro will perfectly track the set point. And this yellow line here is the gyro. That's what the quad is actually doing. And what we can see is that there is some stair steppiness in the... Uh, RC command and in the set point. And there are various things that can cause this stair steppiness. For example, um, RC command is not made up of a continuous line of stick movement. As each packet comes in, the stick position is updated. And that means that depending on how fast the packets come in, there's always going to be some stair steppiness to the RC command trace. But the Betaflight developers know what the frequency of each protocol is, 
how fast it updates, and they can build in and have built in some filtering to remove that stair steppiness. So when we see this stair steppiness, we shouldn't be seeing this under normal conditions. And what this means is that packets are either being delayed longer than they normally ought to be, or maybe a packet got corrupted and we're just seeing a repeat of the previous one. The bottom line is that this stair steppiness is affecting how smoothly our PID controller operates and how smoothly our motors operate. Let's take a look. So we can see really clearly down here, this red line here is the P term. And you can see that there is, well, like even if you don't know what all is going on here, if we just hit M key to mark and we mark the stair step duration, we can see that there is some sort of oscillation in the P term that corresponds with the stair stepping up here in RC command and the set point. So we're affecting the ability of the PID controller to make the quad do what it should be doing. And not only that, but if we add, let's take uh, the PIDs out and add the motors. If we take a look at the motors, we can also see that the motors are kind of going bonkers. So this stair stepping is not just, I mean, if you look at the gyro line, the gyro is pretty smooth and you're like, well, what does it really matter? I don't know. I mean, you can kind of see a little bit of wobble here in the gyro as the gyro tries to track. See, this stair step is relatively abrupt as I deflect the stick, but as I return the stick to center, it's a little bit more of a gradual movement. And here you can see the gyro kind of wobbling and the motor's kind of going. Bleh, 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 bleh. So the promise is that by syncing everything up and eliminating or reducing this stair steppiness, Crossfire Shot will make things better. Let's go ahead and install it, and then we'll see how that how it flies. The first thing to do then is to download this zip file from the link in the video description. It is the nightly build of OpenTX that supports Crossfire Shot. In that zip file, you're gonna find a folder and in that folder are a bunch of different firmware. You're gonna pick the firmware file that matches your radio. So in my case, I have a Jumper T16. I'm gonna pick the T16 file. If you have an X10 or an X9D, whatever it is, you're gonna pick the one that matches your radio. The next thing you need to do is flash that firmware to your radio. And I'm gonna show you the method that involves holding these two trim switches inward while you power on the radio. And then you're gonna come up in bootloader mode. This mode is nice because you don't need to use OpenTX Companion if you don't want to. Here I'm plugging in USB. You can flash this firmware using OpenTX Companion if that's what you're most comfortable with though. When I plug in USB, I'm gonna get a new folder that is my SD card that's in my radio. I'm gonna go into the firmware folder and then from that zip file that I downloaded from TBS, I'm gonna take the bin file that is appropriate for my radio, so in my case, the T16 file, and I'm gonna drag that into the firmware folder on my radio. Some radios will be fine. Other radios will require you to reduce the character count of the file name to eight characters. You might need to rename the file from this long file name to some, anything shorter than eight characters. But in my case, I can just drag and drop it. It works correctly for my radio. After that file has copied over to the SD card, I'm gonna go ahead and unplug USB. And then from within this menu, I'm gonna choose Write Firmware. Once I click Write Firmware, I'm gonna select that firmware. I'm gonna see all the firmware in the firmware's folder. I'm gonna select that firmware and long press, and it will flash that firmware to the radio. After that's done, I can press the sys key and then page to the versions page, and I can double check the firmware version to confirm that it's updated correctly. Here on the versions page, you can see my version is OpenTX T16 TBS. You'll also get a warning when you first power up that this is a nightly build and only for test purposes. The next thing we need to do is update the firmware on our Crossfire module. So I'm gonna power the radio down and I'm gonna plug the Crossfire module into USB. Then we're gonna go into the TBS Agent X software. You can get that for free from the TBS store. There's a link in the video description if you haven't got it. And when we plug in the USB, it's gonna automatically select our TBS Crossfire module to manage. From there, we're gonna hit the firmware button and we need to flash firmware 328 or newer. Uh, 328 is the last uh, stable version at the time of making this video. So I picked 328 and we're just gonna update the module with that firmware version. 
Of course, having done that, you're also going to need to update the receiver. Uh, the Crossfire module will do this over the air, but you do need to remember to do that the very first time that you connect to your receiver. Uh, and then after that, there's one more setting that we need to change. Here in the Nano RX menu, there's an option to set whether you're using 50 or 150 hertz, and it is the RF profile option. Now, that used to be dynamic, but they've given you the option to lock it to 150 hertz. And if, you if you're not flying super long range, this is what's recommended to do. This will keep the packets as consistent as possible. All right, here we go. First flight on Crossfire Shot. To be honest with you, I am not super latency sensitive. So if I can tell any difference at all, it means that this is like an amazing validation. We know for a fact that the latency is lower. It's just a question of if it's like such a drastic difference that even a like a clod like me can tell. Hmm. Uh, let's go, let's fly it. The other thing I'm really curious about is gonna be whether the RSSI stays good even, or the link quality, even though we're locked at 150 hertz. Okay, here we go. Crossfire shot. Like, can I tell the difference? LQ is holding. Let's just do a pass around the property and check if LQ continues to hold. Yeah, LQ is holding uh, at around 300, pretty much through the whole property. So that's nice. Yeah, no problem with LQ. Can I feel any difference in the latency? I might be imagining it. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. I'm really glad to be able to lock at 150 hertz, I'll tell you what. It's always bugged me. Like I'd almost rather take a small hit in LQ in order to have consistent latency. Let's try some more precision stuff where the latency difference might come out. Let's not crash there, shall we? I don't know. I might I might feel a difference. Uh, I don't know. That's that's tough. Like I'm not gonna go back and reflash my whole radio just to turn off Crossfire Shot and see if that's really making a difference. But I've been doing a uh, three packs a day challenge with this quad. So I've been flying this exact same quad three packs a day and I'm a, I feel like I'm kind of tuned into where it's at. And I, I think I might feel the difference. That's something. The thing about latency is that latency is cumulative. Your brain can get used to a surprisingly high amount of latency and you kind of don't know what you're missing, but then when you get rid of the latency, you feel just that little bit more connected, just that little bit more connected. And it's really when you go back from high, low latency to high latency that you're like, oh, oh, this is so bad. Like you get, you get just, it's just a little bit better for the low latency. And you think, oh, it's not that much of a difference. But then when you get used to it and you go back, you're like, this is crap. So I feel like there's definitely, Something here. Cool, well, I mean, I can't wait for it to be final. I don't feel 100% comfortable running this nightly build, but it's definitely making a difference. I wonder what we'll see if we go look at the black box. Hmm, let's do that. 
Well, if we look at this black box log from that flight, we can see some improvement, but it's not perfect. I've picked out a couple examples to show you. And here we've got RC command on roll, and down here we've got the same thing on pitch. And we can look for that stair stepping, and specifically the stair stepping in the set point, which is the blue line. And we can see the stair stepping is sort of less distinct. It's got it's more sort of rolled off. The edges are being smoothed, and I think that is Betaflight's built-in low-pass filtering or averaging. It's more able to smooth those edges off, but we can see that there's definitely still some stair-stepping in the set point, so things are not perfect. But overall, as we look at these, we can definitely see that there is less stair-stepping in the RC command and in the set point. So I think we've definitely made an improvement even if things aren't perfect. And it's definitely worth keeping in mind that the improvement in latency by locking Crossfire to 150 hertz and not letting it fail back to that 50 hertz mode, that improvement in latency, you're not gonna be able to see that in the black box, but it's 100% there. And the improvement in latency caused by that heartbeat sync that's very real, and what you're getting is more consistent latency. And whereas before, the average might be low, but there would be some extreme cases where the you would get high latency very for very brief periods of time. Now you're going to have more consistent latency. So I felt like I could feel a difference, and for coming from me, I think that's saying a lot. I don't think this really lived up to some of the promises that it would make the black box traces like 100% perfect, although. Well, to be fair, Chris Thompson never said it'll make it perfect. He just said, if you really want to get the best possible tune, this is the thing you need to do. Also worth pointing out that Betaflight 4.2 has additional stuff in it to help deal with these scenarios and help work even better. Betaflight 4.2 is still a few months from being out. But I think if you're running Crossfire and you're running OpenTX, then Crossfire Shot is definitely, definitely worth a try. It's still in beta, so if there are any bugs, then maybe you would want to back off. You'd want to be aware that that's a possibility. But a lot of people are testing it and don't don't seem to be having any problems with it. Um, eventually, this will be rolled in to the next version of OpenTX, and you won't need to use a beta uh, nightly firmware anymore. Um, I'm not sure what version of Crossfire they introduced the ability to lock the frames 250 hertz, but I would definitely be turning that on unless you're doing really long range stuff where you need the ability to fail back to 50 hertz. If you go to 150 hertz, the range will be reduced. Your max range it will be lower. If you're used to like not even thinking about your antennas at all just because the crossfire range is so high, locking the radio to 150 hertz will mean you'll have to put a little more thought into that. So that being said, the consistent latency and the low latency is definitely, uh, I definitely felt like I noticed it. That's going to do it for this video. Now you know how to try Crossfire Shot if that's something you want. And I, I'm just going to go out with a big, big kudos to TBS. This is a question that people who use OpenTX have been asking for a long time. And for whatever reason, it hasn't been solved until now. And TBS, the promise of open source is that people can contribute these things and to find TBS stepping up and contributing this to OpenTX. Instead of baking it, they could have taken the FreeSky model, they could have baked this into the TBS Tango with Freedom TX and said, oh, the TBS Tango doesn't need this fix. It's already doing this. They just did it right from the beginning. They could have just locked it to their own radio and said, nobody else gets it which is the kind of thing that like, it seems like FreeSky might have done today, and they didn't. TBS contributed this to the open source project for everyone to benefit from, and that's really amazing, and kudos to them for doing that. <coughs> this is Joshua Bardwell coming at you uh, from uh, the recovery wing of, <laughs> of, my, of my coronavirus compound, and uh, I don't have coronavirus as far as I know. It's just a joke. Uh, but I am getting over a cold. I'm very happy to be producing content for you guys again. Thank you so much for watching. Happy flying, everybody.